Well, welcome to the March meeting uh, from sunny Florida, or now the sun's down, so I can't claim it, but uh, thought I'd take a few days and get some sunshine. So I hope you guys are all keeping your toes warm. Um, anyway, uh, welcome to anybody who's a new member or guest that's joining us this evening. Uh, I think you'll uh, enjoy what we're going to do. We're going to cover some good material this evening. Um, if, if you are new, please kind of wave your hand so everybody gets to see who you are. And, uh, ah, great. Glad to have you on board. Um, if you're visiting tonight, and not a member of our chapter, wave your hand just so we can say hello. Uh, there we go. Good, good. Oh, we got a good crowd tonight. Uh, really, that's that's good. Hey, Joe, I hope I hope the other thirty people show up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so uh, let let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the agenda for this evening. I, I put together some notes here, so bear with me if I kind of look off to the side. Um, so. Uh, I got word today uh, from Heather that um, uh, Mount uh, Pleasant High School is starting to open up the doors again. Um, at this point, uh, we've been approved to come into the school to do the uh, student education program. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment here. Um, the um, the thing that I'm uh, interested in is is that right now um, our April meeting will be a Zoom meeting because we have a uh, an IRD uh, coming up, uh, which is a remote demonstration, and then uh, the May meeting. If if all goes well we may try to hold at the high school so we can get to get together in person again. Um, so I think that's good news. Um, Heather's been uh, texting me on a regular basis to kind of keep me abreast of, of what's going on there. I know the other day she sent me a note and said that um, the students were all going to be able to take their masks off and I I told her, don't worry about it because they're still the same students. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, Mike Adams here. I don't, I hadn't seen him. Mike, are you there? Uh, okay, well, um, Mike was gonna update us on the Beads of Courage uh, program. If you've turned a box for the Beads of Courage, it looks like right now, uh, based on what we have anticipated, that it will probably be uh, mid-April before the hospital will be ready to accept some new boxes. Um, unfortunately, our liaison has not been very communicative. I think she may be out on vacation. so. At this point, we don't know for sure exactly what date, but very typically it's the th third week, the Thursday of the third week in the month is when they open the doors for the uh, donors come in and make their donations. So that's kind of when we anticipate it'll work. So um, we'll let you know more at the as soon as we know and. Uh, Potentially, we'll start collecting stuff in the early part of April. Um, okay, an update on the student instruction. Um, we've got sort of a strange situation. First of all, we didn't know exactly when the school was going to open up and when we were going to be able to get in there. And secondly, um, the spring break for Mount Pleasant High School um, falls at an odd time this year. Originally, normally we probably would have started the program in March, but 
Uh, it turned out that if we started the program in March, we wouldn't have had enough days with each student to complete a project before they'd leave on spring break. So we uh, concluded that we're gonna start the instruction April 25th, and it'll probably run uh, through the first and, and or second week of May. Um, right now, Eric's uh, uh, holding um, a bunch of wood to make bowl blanks out of, and sometime during March uh, or early April, we'd like to get a crew of people together to come over to Eric's and help us um, carry the logs around, get them cut up and um, then get them turned into bowl blanks. And we probably could use six or seven people um, uh, because there's quite a bit to do and the more help we have, I think the faster we can get it done. Um, We'll give you a heads up and uh, ask for some volunteers to help. Um, the, these boards are uh, two to three inch uh, oak. Is it oak, Eric? It's mostly oak. Uh, there's some uh, red mulberry in there between three and five inches thick. Three and five, okay. And so I got two band saws, chainsaw, and a bunch of different uh, jigsaws ready to go to work. And Heather mentioned to between a minimum of 65 uh, bull blanks were what was required. Yeah, so yeah. Normally, my wife and I do it. You know, we, we did a couple hundred last year or the last two times that we've done it. Um, but the wood was two inches thick. Uh, this is a little heavier than the two of yeah. us can handle. So yeah, it's it's some pretty serious boards. So we'll we'll need the help, and uh, we'll we'll give you a heads up when when we can schedule it. Yeah. Um, but in any case, um, it appears at this point, the way this is going to work is, is that she has roughly 62 to 65 students that'll be, uh, taking wood turning from us. And, um, they're broken into, uh, essentially four classes. Um, two of the classes have, um, eight eight to 10 students max. And so in any given day, um, we'll, we'll have two classes that will have these, these 10 students or so. And on those days, we probably only need two instructors. But uh, the other two days, uh, the two classes uh, contain about 50 some odd students and so we envision that we're probably going to need uh three four four instructors maybe five um so that we can break the students down into um maybe three students per instructor and that will give us time um to um get all the students through their project now the project right now is going to be bowls again uh, even though some of the students have turned before, we're not going to try to do new, uh, a new project. We're going to stick with the bowls because some of them have lost lost so much time. They're they're rusty on what we taught them before. So that's that's the reason we're going to stick with bowls. Um, so are when we, we able, get, are we able ahead. to come? Are we able to come as a as a spectator? Or yes. assistant to the instructor so we can yes. pick yes. up some of the pointers also? Yes. Answer is yes. Yeah. yeah. Now we've uh, we've already received approval from the school district to do this. Uh, they're they're on board. So, you know, we'll we'll be able to to be in the school without any problems. Um my 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 gut feeling is is by that point in time you know, we won't have as much of a concern over COVID as, as has been in the past. Um, so that's the latest that we have. Um, and again, you know, this is a dynamic situation. So we'll keep you posted as, as we know things. Uh, next thing uh, was I wanted to bring up uh, the Delaware State Fair as 
some of you know and some of you may not know, uh, each year we put up a display um, for the Delaware State Fair and uh, we collect up uh, members pieces and we put them out for display for the public. Um, we also encourage and have participated in the judging of, of pieces. So if you're interested in entering one of your pieces for uh, judging, um, you know, there's a separate process for that. And we'll get that out to you in more detail. Um, the state fair is usually the last two weeks in July. Um, so we have a little bit of time if you want to think about something that, you know, you want to work on that you think is, um, you know, worthy of, of having somebody from an artistic background or, you know, uh, a judging background to come in and look at it and evaluate it. And of course, you know, if you win, you can win $2, you can win $4, you might win $18, you never know. Um, so we, we've had a lot of fun with it. I am looking for some folks to help uh, with this project or somebody that would like to take the lead on it. Um, Eric's done it for the last uh, three or four years and uh, he's asked to, to uh, be able to move on. So I'm looking for somebody who would like to get involved. Uh, certainly I'll be there and some other folks that are familiar with it. So uh, um, I, I want you to, think about whether you can spend a little time and help us out. Uh, it's not a huge time uh, commitment, but um, it, it just takes uh, a couple of weekends and, and some time to gather up all the pieces. Um, Joe, I, I've got you next on the list. Do you wanna jump into whatever you have to offer? Yeah, I just wanna, I just wanna briefly mention, <clears throat> um, uh, tomorrow actually kicks off uh, Do More 24 Delaware, which is a, um, a statewide fundraising event here in Delaware. Um, it's, uh, it's an effort to, um, it, there, there's, there's hundreds of nonprofits that are participating <clears throat> in the event uh, tomorrow, including First State Wood Turners. We are a registered uh, 501c3 nonprofit. And I got us signed up and registered for it. We have a fundraising page. Um, so what it is, it's it's exactly 24 hours um, uh, of giving. So, so it's a 24-hour fundraiser <clears throat> to raise awareness for, for Delaware nonprofits, uh, to engage new donors. Um, tomorrow morning at 6 a.m., you will all be receiving an email uh, with all the details and a link to our fundraising page. We have a fundraising goal uh of five hundred dollars um <clears throat> that we would like to to use towards uh the uh the the teaching in mount pleasant high school that tom was just talking about you know to buy you we, you know use the money to buy tools chucks uh wood blanks if necessary uh so that's our goal like i said you'll be getting an email tomorrow morning at 6 a.m look for that email uh and also um, you know, we, we'd greatly appreciate it if you could make a make a donation um, to help us reach our goal. And also, please share it on. There, there'll be a link there. You can share it on social media. So you know, share it on your Facebook page. But it's only 24 hours. It starts tomorrow at 6 p.m. and it goes through to Friday at 6 p.m. So so uh, March 3rd through March 4th, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, and that's all I had, Tom. Okay. Um, while I'm uh, thinking about it, are, are there any questions or comments on anything we've talked about so far? Hey, Tom, this is Peter Boyson. Yeah, Peter. Um, question for you. You had mentioned the April meeting is going to be a Zoom meeting and then may, may be a face-to-face uh, -face meeting. Yes. Um, question, since I live down in Southern Delaware in Millsboro next to Lewis, Yes. They, is there any intention of zooming these meetings because it's kind of a i'm not sure where that meeting place is i'm not sure where that high school is but yeah it's well a, it's a it's a good long haul for you to get up there it it, it would be about an hour and 10 minutes at least yeah so are you um, planning to zoom no we're well? yeah we're, we're we're planning on doing hybrid meetings uh here on out uh we're gonna 
have, we're going to be, be live great. streaming. Yeah, live streaming the meetings. Uh, we've we've invested in the equipment um, to make that possible. And we, you know, because we have a because we have so many people that are far flung throughout the Mid Atlantic region. We've we've made a commitment to them to everyone to to you know keep them on board. So even we have a live meeting, we'll be live streaming that meeting uh, at the same time. Yeah, excellent. Good. Um, okay, uh, I know a lot of you were anticipating uh, the president's challenge this month, um, but um, for technical reasons, we've we've uh, moved the president's challenge to uh, May. Um, if you're not aware of what the challenge was, it was to make something with feet. Um, and what I had specified was is that um, it, it not be uh, a round pedestal or a round ring, but that it actually represent feet, whether it's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, whatever it happens to be. Um, can be a bowl, a box, whatever, whatever your imagination comes up with, uh, just so long as it has feet, identifiable feet on it. Um, if you've already done it uh, and maybe put it in the uh, show and tell, that's fine. Um, but we'll have a link uh, coming out that will uh, let you uh, enter it specifically in the president's challenge. Um, so you got a little extra time and I hope everybody will uh, consider what they can put together. Um, I'm just going to open the floor for a minute here and ask if anybody else has anything they want to announce or let everybody know about. Okay, hearing none, I think we're ready to move into the next part of our program and uh, uh, it'll be the show and tell portion of it. So let me go ahead and share my screen. I think, first of all, I better bring up the slides. That might help. OK. Right. Sorry, I didn't have this uh, cranked up sooner. All right, here we go. All right. OK. There we go. Tom, I'm going to quickly mute everyone, and then um, then you can unmute yourself. Okay. All right. Joe, if this thing starts to get flaky, will you pick it up for me? Sure. All right. So. We lost your speech. <clears throat> Tom, you have to unmute yourself. Tom, can you unmute yourself? Uh oh, I messed up. <laughs> uh, well, is, was he a host or co host? I'm he's, there, you go. There, there he is. He's a co host. The, the machine is shutting me down, Joe. Uh, I think you're going to have to run the slideshow. Did, uh oh, I, okay. Where, where is it? It's on the demo page, you know, the demo yep. folder. Give me one second. It, what it's doing is the bandwidth is so low that when I bring up the slide, it shuts off my uh, audio. One second, getting there. We, we kind of anticipated this, but we weren't sure. While he's doing that- it, What's it called? It's called uh, the March- It's the first- March show and tell March 2022. Got it. Um, the way this is working is we we did a test last night. We found out that um, if I use the uh, the re local internet, I can't. It's so flaky. I can't get a good signal out. So what I did was create a, video, a VPN tunnel back to my own computer in Delaware. 
and I get better service out of my internet than I am here. So you're literally watching a connection to Delaware and then coming out on the internet. And uh, it's not doing too badly, but uh, you know, there's a bandwidth restriction that I can't overcome. And it's interesting. Up in the sky somewhere that's not hooked up. Yeah, I, I could get a bigger microphone, but it won't help. <clears throat> Joe, you got her there? I do, I do. Um, I will share my screen and get that up there. Let's see. Tom, with PowerPoint, do you have to, uh, well, you have to click, you have to click on the open, the, the full screen no. version. Yeah, no, I know that, but you do that before or after you share the screen. I mean, uh, let me no, just try it. After, after you share the screen. Or I mean, Got it. Sorry, folks. Uh, um, there we are. Are we full screen? There, yes. Yeah. OK. All right. So as your name comes up, um, just go ahead and talk about your piece. And Joe will uh, flip through the slides for you. I'm trying to flip through the sides. What's uh, it's not working? Let's see. There we go. Don Searles, you're up. Okay, I'm up. This is called horse oak, and I didn't know what horse oak was, but if you look very carefully, you can see the horse in the upper right part of the bowl there. <laughs> it's um, uh, it was it was a pretty piece of wood. And it was out of out of balance the whole way through because all that white curly stuff is about half rotten. Well, let's, I won't say it's rotten, but it's it's not as dense as the straight grain is. But it it was it was a lot of fun to turn. Uh, I enjoyed it. And that okay. Is okay, Eric. Um, Eric is up. He's got a bunch of stuff here it looks like bottle stoppers sure so for those that don't know a i collect wood um and i make lid boxes out of each species and i make bottle stoppers out of each species <clears throat> i uh, traded some uh, wood with uh, another wood collector he, he sent me 17 new species and uh, between cookwoods and a couple other places i bought a whole bunch of wood uh, last month and this month so I made a bunch of bottle stoppers. Uh, next slide. Thanks. Should be two okay. of them. Yeah. Oh, sorry. There we go. There you go. So I made a bunch of bottle stoppers in the, in the last two weeks. Uh, all different <laughs> species. Um, I don't know what else to say. The, the number 575 there, the T-handled one, that doesn't screws and becomes a, a cork remover. But most of the rest of them are, uh, you know, standard bottle stoppers. So hmm. up to 582. So moving along. So along with the species that uh, I got from Gary out in Indiana, um, I made a couple pens out of it. Uh, interesting uh, black locust burl was really pretty. I did make a bowl, but I didn't figure people would care about seeing it. Uh, and lemon scented gum and Blakely's red gum species you can't buy. They're kind of interesting. Uh, and then I thought the colors were kind of distinctive. So I included them in this. Although the lemon scented actually is a pencil, but. So my new year's resolution was to clean off the five or six places that I had rough turned an item and then uh, set it aside to dry. Some of them have been sitting up on the shelves for 10 years. So uh, I, I haven't cleaned off a single shelf yet, but I'm working on it. And one of those was a uh, Coca-Cola bowl. Um, I guess you call it bowl versus a hollow form. Really pretty piece of wood. Of course, it'll get darker. Next slide. So anyway, it came out real nice. I kind of like this shape, um, so I, make it frequently of different species, mostly because the wife likes it. So it's, it's, a, it's a winner for me. Eric, what kind of wood was that, the reddish? Coco Bolo. Uh, oh. It's a rosewood, true rosewood. Yeah, wow. Although there's two different species that are sold as Coco Bolo, so I can't tell you which one it is, but uh, a, it was still pretty. That's a, so. 
That's a big piece. Usually it's smaller, you know, that's really um, good. I was lucky that I've been collecting wood for a long time. And I, when I lived in Massachusetts, which is where I was prior to here for 18 years, there was a, uh, a rare woods, exotic woods shop. And believe it or not, I bought that uh, like 20 years ago, 22 years wow. ago, actually, for $24. <laughs> and I have, I don't know, 10 pieces that size. So. Whoa. Yeah, they're on sale. Uh, another it? story for another day. How big is it? It was um, six inches tall and four inches in diameter. Thank you. Yeah, the, the up front, somewhere along the line. The, 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 so this was a full size. This is part of my New Year's resolution. This was a full size uh, uh, cherry bowl. I mean, it was like 14, 15 inches in diameter and about six inches tall. And it had been sitting on a shelf for a long time. Bottom line is it had a crack on the side. So I shrank it. And since the uh, president's challenge was to put feet on it, since it had a, a relatively large, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm brain, brain dead, um, on the bottom. So I flipped it over, put it on a vacuum chuck, and, and turned the uh, tenon into a, a rim, and then uh, turned some feet. And then carved them away and sanded it down, which was kind of interesting because I had never done that before. So I do have another footed one coming up, hopefully next month, uh, completely different design. But it was a really pretty piece. I just couldn't see uh, wasting it. So I carved away the sides and, and made a small jello bowl out of it. Mm -hmm. yep. right, that's it. Sir, there we go. Gail. Well, where, where's the picture of them? There you are. I've just started uh, trying doing bowls last month. So I've got a couple that I've finished. Um, these are all out of the wood pile on the driveway. Uh, I think I accidentally said the one on the right was hickory. It's not, it's, um, oh, geez, it's on a blank. The green stuff, poplar. And uh, dark one is walnut. So I don't know. These are some of my first ones. Very nice. Interesting nice. that you added the burn rings. Yeah, I like the contrast of the light colored wood with the dark lines. That's kind of fun. And then I think there's a, another slide is two others that I did. Yeah, those are those are both out of a chunk of cherry that uh, was in my sister's garage when she moved years ago and I grabbed it and said someday I'm going to learn to turn bowls I want that wood <laughs> so I finally did <laughs> very nice nice first effort thank you Jim had on mute uh this is a a tea light for a tall tea light it could be a wig stand as well. My granddaughter likes to play with, I had a whole box full of these battery operated tea lights and I had poured epoxy mold to, with the intention of making a, a pepper mill out of it. And I saw it laying around here and I, I decided to polish up the one side. It was like half epoxy and half uh, spalted maple. And so I drilled in and put the uh, battery operated tea lights in. I didn't send along pictures of, they're accessible on the back and you can actually change the battery if you want. Uh, the base the base is a pear, uh, pear from an old tree at our old homestead. Top is oak, just kind of fun. I had made the base uh, so the Fisher Price children would sit on them, you know, the little wooden ones. Well, sorry, my granddaughter's not into Fisher Price, so she promptly decided marbles fit there. So, next one. <laughs> oh, um, sorry about that. Here we go. Okay. A friend of mine uh, was in sales a lot of his life, and you might imagine his walls were covered with placards and awards and all that stuff he tore them all off the 
what turned out to be walnut bases and said, Jim, do you want to do anything with this? So I threw them up on my shelf. The other day I said, you know, this is going to be an easy way to make a walnut segmented bowl. So I glued four layers of those. I had to pull all the screws out and everything, four layers and rotate them when I glued them up. So they kind of have a segmented feel to it. I wish I had not used, uh, I used half and half, which is walnut, uh, not walnut oil, which is tongue oil and citrus on it. It darkened it more than I wanted. I wish I'd have used Mahoney's walnut oil, it probably wouldn't have darkened as much. I There might be a second picture which shows the inside a little more, yeah. So it was uh, just a chance to reuse some wood that otherwise would go in the fire pile. So mm -hmm. I think there's one more. Oh, that yeah, that's finished with half and half. So I mentioned that. I think there's Next. one more, Joe. Yeah. You're going backwards, Joe. There it is. There. Yeah. Uh, a guy from the Langster Club who's a good friend of mine is actually kind of my mentor. He's been turning a long time and he's got that big mustard colored lathe which you know everybody envies anyway he uh he was clearing out the pile of stuff that accumulates underneath the his uh wood bench when you decide you couldn't do it or for some reason but this turned out to be a lovely piece i had to turn out the screws screw holes left by his faceplate, but it worked out i think there's one more profile it's black walnut with a little imperfection which uh, was easily cured by putting some CA glue in it. I'm a big fan of black CA glue for fixing holes like this. Yeah, that was it. I That was kind of repurposed wood again too. Uh, you know, it's a big thick oddball piece and I'm, yeah, fun. Jim Wadham. Yeah, I'm here. There we go. This one is just a uh, this was a practice piece um, that uh, I was using to uh, try out the Paul Howard fluting jig uh, just to see how well it worked. Uh, the rim is, is much thicker than I wanted and uh, the flutes are a little too deep and I would have used, uh, if I'd known it was going to turn out uh, as decent looking in the end as this did, that I would have used a, a, a core box bit instead of a uh, a straight bit because I think a, a rounded bottom on the flute would have been better. But anyway, this was just to see how the, the Paul Howard fluting jig worked. And uh, it turned out okay. There's another one that shows the side profile and you'll see the rim is, is certainly thicker than one would want on this. But I had no idea how it was going to turn out. So I thought I want to leave myself enough to turn it away in case I screw it up the first time. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it turned out decent enough. The uh, the first time that I didn't need to turn it away. So anyway, just a practice piece, but it came out okay. Cool. And this is just a small uh, Kurupau bowl. Uh, Eric, you probably know way more about this than I do. That's normally called Patagonian rosewood, but I'm told that's really a misnomer since it's not a rosewood. But uh, anyway, I got a bunch of blanks from a place called Gotwood and uh, same size blanks. They were eight inch by two inch uh, blanks and uh, made a nice little bowl. Still pretty. Yeah. Very nice. What finish did you use on it? Um, all of them are finished with uh, deft uh, satin lacquer. These next two are a couple of segmented bowls. Obviously, this is uh, purple heart mostly with yellow heart and uh, uh, the uh, and sapelli and hard maple uh, in the bottom. The dark ring, interestingly, and again, Eric, you will know way more about this than uh, than I do. The, some of the smaller, uh, darker pieces that are in between the yellow heart are uh, it's you can't really see it in this picture, but they are purple heart and wenge. That's not really wenge in the ring around there. That's actually um, uh, partridge. 
which is uh, what's the other name for that, Eric? Angeline, Angeline, something like that. Almost all of it's sold under partridge. It burns yeah. like or it turns like concrete, but it's yeah. pretty. Weird. Yeah, it was it was interesting stuff. It actually, if you see the the wood in person, it looks almost identical to the uh, uh, Wenge that I have sitting next to it, uh, almost virtually indistinguishable. Uh, and the place I bought it, Exotic Lumber in Annapolis, said that a number of less reputable uh, places sell the partridge as Wenge, uh, depending on whether it's the darker grain. Wood. A lot of partridge tends to be apparently lighter grain than that, I'm told, but that's the first I've used of it. So. Might have been Panga Panga, uh, which no, actually I looks like Wenge, except it's a little lighter colored and it's a lighter, less dense wood. Yeah, I have some Panga Panga, and that is lighter than the Wenge. This is this was definitely partridge and okay. uh, looks remarkably like the Wenge. It was mm. odd. She assured me it was partridge, not Wenge, but who knows? And this last one is uh, 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 another segmented bowl. Um, uh, I think I'm trying to think the size of this one. It's 14 inches by four, and uh, uh, maple, yeah, maple yellow heart, purple heart, and Purdue. So, yeah, it's it's fun turning. Although trying to get those uh, the uh, uh, recess in the bottom for the uh, uh, accent ring is challenging. I had to come up with a cross slide vice device to allow me to. Uh, uh, turn that with enough precision that uh, there wasn't a gap uh, between what I was trying to turn very judiciously and the uh, uh, and the accent ring, but uh, it turned out okay finally in the end. Very nice. Yeah, Thank nice. You. That's it. I my buttons aren't working consistently here. Sorry, <laughs> it's it's stalling. Okay, Pete, you're up. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Pete Morgenthaler. That's a piece of apple. That my, my neighbor took down an apple tree and I got uh, eight cutoffs from it. And um, the reason it's so spalted is uh, I stored it in water for about a year and a half. And of course, if there's water in there, they'll, uh, you can spalt it. And it's, uh, it's quite, apparently, I read that uh, spalted wood is pretty popular, uh, hard to find, but I made my own by mistake, I guess, you know? Um, so I have about, uh, I think I have about six more pieces that I can make a, a bowl out of. Uh, and they've been in the water for three and a half years. This, I took out, uh, I took out of the water in 2020, that year I said, I'm gonna get all these done. Well, I got about five done, and um, some some of it was uh, cherry that he also took down, and um, so I didn't get them all done. So I left them in the water, and I don't have any of them that are punky. They uh, they uh, they do pretty well winter, winter, summer, all the whole year. But uh, it uh, apple is apple's a little tough to turn. It uh, it keeps, um, when you, you're using a nice sharp uh, uh, scraper, you know, um, negative, uh, whatever it is, negative, I grind it back like that. Negative um, rake. Yeah, negative rake, right, thank you. Uh, and um, I have a couple, I've made a couple of them and just if you go slow, it, it goes pretty well. Uh, now, Going back to when I was in Ellsworth, David Ellsworth's class 12 years ago, <laughs> a long time, he uh, he was telling us, you know, once you get this wood in a in a wet and you, you turned it once, you put it in the bag, and uh, then he took sawdust and chips, wet them and threw them in the bag so that he could spalt it. Well, I just soaked the bowl in water, plastic tubs, and uh, that's what I got. So. Uh, my neighbor liked it. I turned her one first, and then I got to do one for another neighbor on the other side of us. Um, so that's that's. Uh, do I have another picture? 
So putting in water does one other thing, Pete, and that is it stops it from cracking because apple is super uh, cracky wood. I mean, it yeah. really, literally it just yeah. splits. Well, I, I, I did. I cracked the bowl of shallow because I didn't do the two inch cut that takes out the uh, center. Uh, I left it there and and it, it cracks pretty easily, but uh, um, you can tell where the center is by the by the by the uh, grain there, the, the direction of the um, spalting. But um, it's going to be interesting. I, I got a I got a piece of uh, cherry in there, and I it's I took it out of the bag, and that's been in the bag for for uh, two years too, and one bag and maybe less, maybe only a year, and. Uh, um, I don't see any spalting on the outside, but when I rough it, when I rough it uh, down this weekend, you know, maybe I will, I'll, I'll get some spalting. But, but it usually, not every wood will spalt like that. Um, it's usually lighter woods, like, like you said, uh, poplar. Um, okay, that runs me down, guys. Wait, sorry, um, Tom. Yeah, so so this is a piece of wood. Um, my wife and my neighbor were telling me that Dildot had taken down some trees the side of the road on a, on a narrow road. So I went and looked at it, and it was a beautiful um, ambrosia maple. Turned out to be some huge trees, and uh, loaded up my car and bought some home. This is a couple of years later now. It's just a uh, a big bowl. That's all. But I thought it came out pretty nice. There's another slide there, I think. Yeah, and, and there you see that on the side. I thought that was really nice. Nice green, green pattern. Hey, Tom, how long after you got it home did you turn it? Because it looks very nice and white. Um, I, I did a, uh, a rough turning pretty quickly. I you know, took the pith out and roughed it down and then coated it with, uh, I used anchor seal too. Yep. And it sat, sat on a shelf for, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. Um, yep. And then, you know, I, I turned it just uh, last week. And wow. um, th then, then immediately coated it. Yeah. I like it. It's nice and clear. Very nice. Yeah, I, I use the, um, I use that uh, deft uh, wood finish. It's a satin wood finish lacquer. The paint on one thick coat, and then after that's dried a few days, I, I put a thick coat of poly on it, and uh, and clear poly. And I, I find that makes it not too glossy, not too um, you know built up look, but gives it a nice shine. Yeah, beautiful job. And the next the next one is just it was again it was a kind of a funky piece of walnut I had from my yard, and I didn't know what to do with it, and I said oh, I'll just start. Um, I start layering epoxy colors on it. He just basically made a little rainbow epoxy and turned it down, and polished it up. It's a, it's a holoform. I think the next slide shows there was a top. A holoform. That's all. It was a, that, that's pretty interesting. Very nice yeah. uh, concept. You know, I, I found that if you use cut up uh, aluminum flashing and use hot milk glue to, on something like that, you can make the curve. So it wasn't hollowed yet, obviously. So you know you can pour the epoxy, let one one set overnight, and pour another layer, and then go inside and hollow it all out. Yeah, I like the way that came out. How th how thick are the layers roughly? The layer of the epoxy. Yeah. Um. So so it was probably I mean, if you if you see that inner, too bad I don't have a pointer, but you can see the. Um, the inner layer where the epoxy and the wood are. Yeah. So it was just a defect in the wood that kind of curved in there. And uh, so the epoxy is only probably about a half inch to, or so thick all across there once it got all turned down and hauled out. Mm. I, I like to use some epoxy just to, for taking care of defects and like the color of the epoxy. So. Yeah. Well, I finally had a chance to get to a piece of the Evodia that we picked up from St. Joseph's Arboretum. Um, 
this this uh, piece of wood had been sitting for some time, but I put an uh, anchor seal on the ends of it and uh, essentially kept it out of the weather uh, for the for the winter, basically, and uh, decided to um, turn it into a natural edge because the thickness of the piece of wood after I'd cut it in half didn't didn't allow me uh, enough wood to just turn a straight edged bowl. So I turned it over. And the other thing was, is I wanted to highlight the, the heartwood there in the center because I thought it added a nice contrast to it. Um, it's about, a, I think I said eight and a half inch bowl. It's not, not particularly big. Um, but the nice thing I found about the bark on this, um, even though we, harvested this what was it uh, eric about october or something like that september october yeah but it had been cut down in the early spring yeah yeah so you know normally if if you're coming off the winter the bark stays on pretty well uh, but if a piece of wood came down in the summertime it's a little harder to keep the bark on it uh, but the bark on this stayed stayed very firm and it is very firm even now uh, so it gave it that rather uh, cupped shape to the rim. I just thought that had a, a nice appeal to it. Uh, next slide, Joe. And I put a, a ring foot on it. Uh, I tried to recess the center of that so that it looks like a continuous line through, through, the, uh, through the ring. Uh, it's a tad high. I didn't quite get it as even with the outer side of the ring as I wanted, but that was the concept. I think it gives it a smooth look. Yeah. And that's it. Oh, that's the last slide. That's it. That's, that's okay. the last one. Yeah. So right. any, any comments, thoughts, questions? All right, good, good. All right, Joe, I think we're up for the program this evening. All right. So let me let me get a little uh, introduction to this this whole thing. Um, based on the um, survey that Joe does every year, we try to reach out uh, to everybody's interest and find subject matter that that fits that survey. And um, in the last survey that we did, the, the primary interest tended to be in bowls. Um, and obviously, from, from the uh, slideshow we had this evening, bowls were the majority of the, of the things presented. Um, so what we're going to do this year is we're going to present a three-part series. We're going to start out tonight with essentially a uh, log to bowl part one. We're gonna start with taking wood out of a log. We're gonna uh, create the blank. We're gonna talk about how to mount the blank on the lathe safely. Um, next month, we're gonna have uh, Philip Rose do a demonstration uh, of actually turning a bowl. Um, he's gonna break it down into two parts, one being a uh, once turned bowl and then a, a twice turned bowl. Um, um, Phil's, Phil's with us here tonight. Did you notice? Did, uh, no, because I only see one screen. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, Phil, Phil is here. Uh, he's, oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm here, guys. Hey, hey yeah. Phil. I'm glad you could join us, Phil. Thank you for, for I'm glad you could make it. Oh, yeah. thrilled to be here. Looking forward to this. Uh, okay, great, good. great. Um, so Phil uh, is has uh, kindly given us the opportunity to watch his very good techniques, and uh, we're looking forward to it. Um, the third part in May is going to be uh, more about um, uh, finishing the bowl, uh, talking about what what you do after the bowl has been completed. And we'll talk a little bit about the finishing processes that are available. Um, 
it's always been a, a major part of uh, the final product and questions are always coming about over, well, did you use oil? Did you use a surface finish? Uh, did, what did you do? You know, did you use a wax? You know, there's just all kinds of techniques and lots of discussion points. So we're going to kind of try to highlight some of that. So I think it's going to be a good series for everybody to uh, get some information and, and be able to apply it to what, what they're doing. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Joe because he's got technical control tonight. And we've got a couple of video presentations and hopefully uh, it'll generate some questions and some, some interest. All right, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to kick off my, my part of the um, uh, evening tonight is going to be for, uh, getting, oh, let me just go ahead and get this up here. Um, my part is going to be going, getting from the log to the blank. And then Tom will take off, take over from there and talk about ways, different ways to mount that blank on the lathe. So I'm going to cover acquiring, handling, transporting, storing, and cutting up logs for blanks. Okay. Um, the, a, lot of, a lot of the logs I use are large, but I'll also be talking about smaller logs, and, uh, and a lot of the same principles will apply, of course. So like I said, I'm, like I said, like I just said, I'm going to be talking about the acquiring the logs, what to look for, what to avoid. Uh, transporting them, handling them safely, uh, how to store them if you want to store them for any length of time, and then processing them into blanks. Oh, um, while I have this up here, this take note on on the on the photo here on this slide. Uh, the, these were all the blanks cut from one section of a log uh, a couple summers ago, I believe. Notice uh, over on the right uh, the stack of um, of cylinders or. or round blanks there. Um, I don't typically cut them up like that until I'm ready to use them. Uh, it, and when I do, I don't know if you can see it or not, but these, they're, they're shrink wrapped. And I'll talk more about that later. Um, and if, if I'm going to be using blanks like this within like say a week, um, I'll shrink wrap them just to, to hold them. Also note on the very top of the, uh, of the stack there, the, uh, the long square blanks, the, long, the rectangular or um, the long blanks. Um, I'll be talking more about that. Those are from the pith section and I always save those. They, those make nice uh, rolling pins, tool handles, mallets and whatnot. So acquiring logs, what are your sources? Well, number one, your local wood turning chapter. <laughs> we often get uh, calls and emails from people who have, uh, they're having a tree come down or they've had a tree come down and we get lots of leads that way. And when we do, we send out a, an email blast to our members, uh, first to members and then to everyone. But uh, we send out first to our members uh, saying, hey, there's wood available and where it is and how you can, how you can get it. Um, also tree removal companies or tree surgeons, if you know any, of the, any people that do in that business where you could just cold call uh, a uh, tree surgeon and say, hey, I'm you know, looking for a log. <laughs> um, you can peruse Craigslist uh, or Facebook Marketplace. Keep an eye out on those places. Um, friends and family, you'd be surprised. Um, ever, ever since you know, people learned or you know, people started learning that I work with, bowl, uh, work with wood and work, you know, make bowls and whatnot, uh, people People pay attention, and if they see a tree down, I get a, I get a call. <laughs> so uh, let let people know that you know what you do, and I'm sure most people, most of your friends and family know know what you do. And uh, I'm sure you're probably in a similar situation where you know people will contact you um, if they have uh, if they know know about something. And um, and um, I'm getting some feedback. Is someone feedback? someone can mute. Anyway, the last thing I have listed here is uh, storm recon. So um, say a storm comes through your area, uh, the next next morning, go out and drive around the neighborhood. You, you know, if it's a bad storm, you might have some, you might see some, some trees down. So do some reconnaissance uh, in that regard. So, so just a comment on the tree surgeons. 
Yes. Um, I, I've talked to a few that were taking down trees either on the road or my neighbors, and they actually have to pay to dispose of the logs. If they take right. them to a place to be turned into mulch, they have to pay for that. So they're happy to have somebody just take them. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Thank you. <clears throat> so when you're when you're getting a log, what to look for? Um, freshly felled hardwoods are preferred. Uh, some exceptions to the hardwoods uh, could be possibly yew, um, cedar, um, any others? Can anyone think of any others, uh, not hardwoods? I mean, obviously you don't want pines or firs, um, but for the most part, hardwoods. Probably in dogwood. Dogwood, yep, that's a good one. Um, generally speaking, trunk sections are preferred over the branches. Now that's just in general. Uh, the trunk sections have less stress on them than branches and they usually grow more symmetrical uh, in you know concentrically. Um, so I, I usually look for trunk sections wherever possible and and you don't want the section of the trunk to start too close to the ground, maybe two foot, two to three foot up, you know, you know maybe two foot up from the ground. That's that's the sweet up, up until the first up up to where, you know where the first set of branches are would be the the best the best um, section of the of the, um, of the trunk. Um, now, the exceptions being of uh, trunk trunks versus branches. The exceptions would be like you know if you're turning goblet greenwood goblets or podlets, you know then you then you would want the branch you know the smaller branches and you know that's fine of course. And um, that this gave me an excuse to put down this photo of these uh, podlets by Greg Gal uh, Galagos, um, which I think are really cool. He makes these from from greenwood branches. <clears throat> so what to avoid uh, when you're looking for logs, um, obviously you don't want trees that have been down for many months or, or, or even years. Uh, you don't want wood that's starting to rot or it's severely cracked. <clears throat> and you don't want, you know, undesirable species like pine or fir or, uh, you know, there's, you know, we get, if you've been doing this for a while, there are certain species you prefer over others, and, and you'll know what they are. <clears throat> okay, handling and transporting. Um, some of the essential tools and equipment that I, I think are essential, uh, and this is by no means a complete list. Uh, this is just a few things. I, I have a, a complete checklist. Like, well, if I'm going on a tree salvage, I have a checklist on my phone that's, that probably has. 35 items on it that I, you know, that I want to take with me. But this, but just generally speaking, you want your your safety gear, safety glasses, hearing protection, uh, chaps, um, leather gloves, uh, your ch chainsaw or or one or two chainsaws, of course, a cant hook, which you see pictured here, <clears throat> um, large wedges or chocks, and you see here that I have a photo of these. This is actually the <clears throat> I bought a set of these at Harbor Freight on sale, um, I think it was like $9 for a pair of them. And they're, they're really nice, they're heavy duty rubber. <clears throat> My only regret is I didn't buy two sets of them. <laughs> so, uh, but they, they come in handy, or you can just cut wedges, you know, in the field, you can cut a wedge from the tree you're working on. I've done that uh, many times too. And you also need a good heavy duty set of uh, ratcheting tie down straps <clears throat> if, if you're transporting these, these, these large logs. So what's a cant hook? This is a cant hook. I mean, figured maybe not everyone would know what a cant hook is. So I just thought I'd throw this in. It's hopefully the video is playing for everyone. Someone nod their head. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Margaret. <laughs> okay. So that's a cant hook. Um, they, it's, they really come in handy for moving big logs. You could be surprised how big of a log you can move with, with one of these. Um, the the ones the one these guys are using are made by Wood Miser. They're they're all steel. It's got a steel bar, uh, but the one over on the right uh, pictured is um, made by steel and it's got a wooden handle. The one I have is a, has a wooden handle. Um, so handling and transporting logs. So like I said, I, I work with a lot of large logs. Um, I have a trailer <clears throat> uh, very similar to the one here on the bottom left. Uh, it's a tilt trailer. <clears throat> So these these tilt bed trailers or or landscape trailers like this one shown on the right here with the the fold down gate, uh, they work really well. 
uh, for baked logs. Um, and what you want to do is you, you want to cut the log to the length of to cut the length of the log to fit the width of the trailer. And I'll show you why in a second here. Um, then you can use a cant hook or a winch to load the logs. Um, and be sure to wedge and tie down the logs, obviously, before you move them. <clears throat> and I'll have more on that in a minute. <clears throat> now, obviously, this is you know, this is for big logs. You know, you can um, if you have smaller logs, you can throw them in the back of your van, uh, your your SUV or your pickup truck. So, several several methods for loading the logs up onto a trailer. Um, this guy is using what I call the can't hook and wedge method. Notice he's got a wedge down there. That he's kicking up as he goes, he just cut a wedge from uh, a section of the, of the tree, like I said, and he's very efficiently moving that log up there and securing it, safely securing it in place. So that's the can't hook and wedge method, which I've, I've done. And then there's the, uh, the winch method. Uh, this is actually me and my trailer. And I got this uh, hand winch from Harbor Freight. Uh, it was less than $20. It's, I think it's a, like a boat winch. Um, and I just set it up and so you can you can wheel up big logs like that. This log I, I really could have done with a cant hook and um, but but you get the idea that's you know using a winch uh, an inexpensive winch or you could you could actually mount a get an electric winch and mount it up there also. <clears throat> and the third method um, for for loading logs is I call the crane method. What you don't have a crane? <laughs> so, this this is actually a salvage I went on uh, several years ago. The homeowner contacted me in advance uh, and invited me up. Uh, they were having this this huge ash tree taken down, and they wanted a, a salad bowl set made out of it. So I was I was there on site, and you know you, you get there and you know you just stay out of the way, just be off to the side, you know, chat up the uh, the crew, be friendly. And they, I wasn't expecting it. I didn't even ask, but they they just loaded these logs right on the trailer for me. It was like the easiest salvage I ever did. They just put these three beautiful, they cut them to length to fit my trailer and just used their, their crane to put them right up on my trailer for me. It was just so nice. And I, in, you know, for, for instance, for cases like this, or whenever I go in a tree salvage like this, I know there's going to be, you know, crew there. Should always take, you know, a stack of ten dollar bills, you know, to tip tip these guys, you know, because they went out of their way to help me out. And like like uh, someone said, you know, this is helping them too because that's less that they got to transport and pay to get rid of. <clears throat> so more on handling and transporting. Um, when you're right before you're ready to go, make sure your load is balanced on your trailer. This is another load I had um, up in Wilmington. Um, a couple of years ago, this, this is red oak, <clears throat> another giant tree. Um, <clears throat> these funny story. These logs you see on on this this on my trailer here, those are actually branches. This tree was a good, I would say, six to eight feet in diameter. It was massive. And these are branches from that tree, and they were like they're probably uh, eighteen to twenty inches in diameter. Uh, anyway, um, so you want to chalk chalk the logs front and back. At, this with you know with chocks or wedges. You can see I just cut wedges here right on site. <clears throat> and again, use ratcheting tie downs to make sure everything is very secure. Okay. Hey, Joe? Yes. What's a trailer like that of yours? What kind of weight does it hold safely? Yeah, it's my trailer. You notice my it has a large, you know, the full size wheels on it. It's uh 30, I think it's 3500 GVW. Yeah. So it'll, you know, that's a lot uh, of weight. What, yeah, well over a ton. Uh, you know, I, I, I try to keep it around a, you know, a ton or less. Um, and I, I even have a formula for calculating the weight of, of logs like this based on the diameter and the length. I have a, a, a an equation. You can plug it in. You can. So you, you know, a log like this is probably about six hundred pounds. <clears throat> yeah. So you, you can get an idea. Uh, but that, that's a good question. Does your trailer have uh, trailer brakes? It does not. No, no, it doesn't. But like I said, I, I try to keep it under a ton. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks. Sure. And how do I unload these? Well, I use the drop and roll method. <laughs> so, so that's how I get them unloaded. <laughs> Easy peasy. 
Now, moving on to storing the logs. Um, first and foremost, you want to seal those ends, OK? Um, you want to use uh, an end grain sealer, such as you know, Anchor Seal is, is the, the big one out there, the name brand. Um, Anchor Seal is just a water-based wax emulsion. It's a proprietary formula. Uh, Craft Supply USA, um, they have an end grain sealer that's very, very similar to Anchor Seal. I, I can't really tell the difference. It works just as well, um, but it's probably $10 less per gallon. Um, and when I'm done here, I'm, I'll put links to all, I have links already to, to load into the chat. So I'll, I'll put some links in for any, any of these products I'm mentioning. Um, <clears throat> so Craft Supplies sells, sells a good uh, end grain sealer. And if the, my strategy with Craft Supplies is, you know, every other month or so, they'll run a, a, a free shipping promotion for, for a week or so. So that's when I order the, the, the gallons of anchor <laughs> or uh, the gallons of wood sealer. <clears throat> You can also use uh, old latex paint to seal the ends of your logs. Um, also, a PVA glue um, diluted approximately 10%. Uh, Mike Mahoney recommended this in one of his demos. And this, this I see I have a photo here of this uh, Amazon Basics. This is just basically Elmer's glue. This is PVA, polyvin polyvinyl acetate glue, um, white glue that you just dilute slightly and you can paste that or paint that on and it works it works great um so that, that works as well and it's it's cheap um you can get two gallons of this uh pva glue on amazon for like 24 dollars, so like 12 dollars a gallon so it is very economical so, yes uh if you go to the paint stores or even home depot or one of those they always have uh batches of paint that was mixed wrong color you can get like gallon really cheap for a couple bucks mm. that's a good idea i hadn't thought of that yeah that's a good idea right <clears throat> what i use cool okay just, so joe just for information yeah i got a, i've got a big uh um what do you call it custom thing magnolia tree in the backyard Branches come down to the ground, and I just roll my wood underneath those branches. Don't seal it. Don't do anything. Just roll it under there, and it doesn't crack. Some of it spots, <laughs> and some of it rots. So, <laughs> okay, I I recommend definitely seal the ends of your logs <laughs> if you want to keep them any length of time. Uh, storing the logs. Um, you want to keep your logs off the ground, okay? Um, I put them, I put mine up on skids, which are just basically two by fours uh, that I cut up, or you, you, know, you can have, you know, if you have a bunch of bricks laying around, um, but keep them up off the ground. These, these, this is actually on, here on my patio. Um, oh, the log on the far right. Uh, remember the a few slides ago, the the crane loading those three giant ash logs. Um, this, this is about uh, probably three years later that the one, the log here on the far right is the, the last of those three ash logs and it held really, really well. I mean, it, I kept it for like, I, I did, I did the first two almost immediately. I processed them. I probably got like 60, 60 bowls or more out of those two logs, but this third one, um, I kept, I just, you know, I didn't get to it. I kept it and it, it stayed nice uh for a good three years and i just finally cut it up just this past summer and it, it was fine it was there was nothing i mean like i said if you see, if you keep the, the end sealed and keep it up off the ground this will keep for a good long time as i as i note here um i recommend you keep the logs whole especially these larger logs keep them whole until you're ready to use them they'll be good for at least a year or more and reseal the ends periodically. If, if you see it starting to dry out, you know, because the stuff will wear off, you know, if you just go ahead, just slap some more end grain sealer or paint or whatever you're using um, if you're gonna, you wanna keep them longer. <clears throat> so more, more uh, storage options. Uh, so, so smaller logs, um, you, can, you can leave smaller logs whole also. Or you can cut them. You can go ahead and just cut them down to blank size. If you're going to think you're going to be using them in the next couple of months, cut them down to blank size. And by blank size, I mean cut them to a length that's just a couple inches longer 
than the diameter. Uh, so that allows for some leeway for, you know, for some checking or some splitting on the ends. And then um, seal the ends and the face of the logs, okay? And oh, before you seal the face, write, take a Sharpie, write the date on it. Uh, and I also write, you know, I also have, I have abbreviations for the species and I'll put the initials of the person, you know, or where I got it. <clears throat> okay. Um, here's, um, <clears throat> this is a, a, a log storage rack that I built a few years ago. Um, mostly just from parts I had on hand. It's uh, four by four pressure treated timbers here uh, and three quarter inch uh, galvanized pipe um, that, I, that I just, I put together and it's, it's out here. Oh, on the, it's out here on the, on my patio uh, up against uh, the wall here. Um, so I, I store half logs like this <clears throat> until I'm ready to use them. And this, this rack is secured to the wall with a chain and, and uh, an eye bolt that goes into a stud. <laughs> so, cause it's kind of narrow, you, you see it's kind of narrow. So it is, you know, for safety, it is secured to the wall. <clears throat> so that's, that's another way to store, store logs. If you have you know, smaller logs um, and this, uh, they notice I have them all slightly slanted. So the, you know, rain or one off of them um, and they'll, they'll keep for a good long time that way, as long as you have them sealed. All right, let's move, move in and start talking about uh, cutting logs up in the blanks. So, so this was a larger log I had. Um, first, I cut off a section of it that was, like I said, a little longer, a few inches longer than the diameter. So I cut this piece of off the main log. Um, then I'll, I got uh, an inexpensive level and I used a level to mark these because then I know all the lines are parallel because I just make all the lines level. <laughs> I just use the, the top site on the level and that makes it easy to keep all the lines parallel. It makes it real easy. Um, so you want to, in the seat in the center, I don't know if you can see, you see my cursor on the screen or not? I don't know if you, yeah, okay. So in the center obviously is the pith. So you want to cut that out and I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave like this two and a half, three inches, depending on the, on the log, I'll leave like maybe three inches, this section here in the center. And like I said, the, the, this piece above and below the pith those are rolling pin blanks, okay? You wanna keep those. Um, and then you just mark this out uh, on one side with, with chalk. And then you wanna transfer your marks to the other side. And on the other side, um, you just, all you need to do is mark up on the top, on the far side with the, you know, with the, your chalk, just mark, just put a little mark there to guide your, you know, so you know when you set your chain saw down at first, you know, so you're cutting straight. Um, so you don't have to you don't have to draw all the lines completely down the other side. You just need to mark it so the so that they're equal width on the other side. Everything lines up. Um, but the, but on this side, this will this is where you want to cut down the lines. So so, then, so so another idea for that whole pith, yeah, is to sticker it the whole pith area whole, and when it dries a year or two later, you can uh, use it to make small river tables. Oh yeah, there you go. That's an excellent idea. Exactly. Yeah, just keep it whole and uh, yeah, that'd be neat. <clears throat> so once you get, you get it marked up, you start cutting. So uh, you don't want to cut all the way down at first. You see how I've done this. I've cut it, cut it down just with an inch or so from the bottom and I'm using plastic felling wedges um, to keep the chainsaw from binding. And, it, it, and if at all possible, use a ripping chain. You can buy a special ripping chain and, and I find them on Amazon usually um, for your chainsaw. And I, my chainsaw has a 28 inch bar, which, you know, it's really, <laughs> if you're gonna do stuff, stuff like this, it helps to have a, uh, a large, a longer bar. So you wanna cut them up like this. And so some takeaways here, notice <clears throat> the photo on the left, I'm wearing chaps, gloves, eye protection, hearing protection. I've got felling wedges here, keeping the, the pieces apart, you know, so that so the saw doesn't bind. Um, I try to be ergonomic because, you know, like everyone, I have issues with my back, but um, try to do it as safely as possible. <clears throat> um, and on the right here, you can see what you, what you end up with. You get, you know, you can get some really nice slabs here uh, doing it this way with, uh, with really minimal effort. Oh, also, 
And notice uh, here on the left, I've got it. I'm using an old pallet <clears throat> to keep it up off the ground uh, and to keep it steady. And I've got wedges on, the, uh, on either side <clears throat> to keep it from moving around on me. All right, circular logic. Um, so once you have your slabs, you want to mark them out and uh, figure out how, how you want to cut them up. So I've, I've got a bunch of these cardboard or poster board rather uh, discs of, you know, all different sizes from like six inches all the way up to 18 inches <clears throat> um, that I use to, to lay out the, the bowls that I'm going to get from a, tip, uh, from a particular slab. Um, uh, no bandsaw, no problem. Like if you don't, if you don't have a bit like this one on the left, um, because of how these are laid out, I took this to my bandsaw and cut them out. This one on the right, this, I just, you know, one giant 18 inch circle. Um, and if you don't have a bandsaw, you, you can just mount it just like it is here because it'll be nothing to turn off these little corners like this. So just lop off the corners like you see I did here. <clears throat> you know, draw the circle first so you have a guide and then lop off the corners with the, with the chainsaw. And usually when I do this, I'll take my smaller chainsaw um, that doesn't have the ripping blade on it or ripping chain on it and lop off the corners whatever because i usually have both of them out there both of them out here with me when i'm doing it and this other <clears throat> this uh, this piece on the right this is a uh, this is again that ash that i that the, the final the final of the three ash logs <clears throat> that you saw earlier um i cut this this past summer and i have a texas um no, no alaska sorry alaskan chainsaw mill uh, so I actually slabbed that log, and this was a slab from that log um, that I'm cutting in, uh, that I marked out circles here, and then, then I, after this, I, I cut them up on the bandsaw, or on the, I cut them with the chainsaw and then took them in and finished them on the bandsaw before I, before I turned them. <clears throat> and so that, that was a lot of, a lot of big logs there. So talking about smaller logs, a lot of the same principles apply. Um, you can see here some, the orientation in a log, uh, what you're looking at. And we talked about the pith and the either the piece on either side of the pith, you, or like if you can keep it whole or you can save these pieces. They show here, you can get a small small plate or something from that piece. But like I said, I just, I just save them. As you see in this photo, I, this is my part of my wood stash. I just save, them and I've got quite a collection of them now for rolling pins or tool handles. And also keep in mind that how you orient the 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 blank on the lathe will determine whether it's uh, a regular bowl or a natural edge bowl. See the one on the top here, the way it's if you orient it this way, you'll have the the bark where the the top of the bowl is, so that'll be a natural edge bowl. Whereas on the bottom piece here, you'll feel orient orient it the other way in the lathe, you'll have a regular bowl. And most of this, I'm sure most of this stuff is just, you know, obvious, obvious to, to a lot of you, but we do have some new turners I know in our, in the chapter. So I thought we'd cover everything here. And just talking a little more about the smaller pieces. Um, so if you have a half log here, <clears throat> I'll take one of those um, poster board discs of the appropriate size and I'll just fasten it with a short with a screw here on the top and use that as a guide um, to cut out on the bandsaw. And you see on the, on the second photo here on the right, it, you just follow the disc around and this is what you end up with. And there it is again, and there it is mounted on the lathe <clears throat> and which, which Tom is gonna talk more about here shortly. Um, and finally for holding blanks for the short term and i mentioned this briefly earlier um i'm a big advocate of shrink wrap i, I get these little um five inch shrink wrap rolls and i i will again i'll put the link i'll put a link in the uh, chat here in a few minutes after i get off uh but you can get them on amazon staples office depot um and it works really well for holding the blanks uh, for short term like i said for a week a week maybe two weeks i mean technically you know <laughs> I've never done this, of course, but it could, you could go a month or so. Uh, but the problem is it'll start to mold. <clears throat> um, 
So and again, I've never done this, but if it does do that, you just I I would just make up a 10% bleach solution and spritz, you know, take off the shrink wrap, spritz wherever there might be some mold, you know, clean it off outside, of course, and you're you're fine. It's good to go. But uh, I I try to do just do use this, you know, for like I said, literally short term. I I've also been um, <clears throat> I've had pieces on the lathe where I couldn't finish it on one day. So I'll actually wrap it up, wrap the piece on the lathe. Like I say, I, I finished the exterior, but I don't have time to finish, you know, flip it around and do the interior. So I'll just wrap, shrink wrap right on the lathe and just leave it there overnight. And we have um, Bakzuski, Bakzuski, I'm sorry, go ahead. What's your question? Hi, is it? Hi, Jen? I'm Jen Bichesky. Hi, Jen. Yeah, I was just wondering what happens if you don't shrink wrap it? If you have um, the blank, uh -huh. what's the purpose of shrink wrapping it? Thank to keep you. it from cracking. It's because this, this is wet. These, these are, this is wet wood. Um, so <clears throat> it, it'll start to crack almost immediately if it's not sealed or shrunk or shrunk wrapped. Shrink wrapped. <laughs> so that's just to keep it, like I said, to keep it from cracking. Uh, short term, because this is typically all, all the all this wood I'm talking about is very pretty wet, pretty green wood. So, so yeah, this you want to different than a blank that you would buy from yes. the store. Yes, this, these these are log. These are freshly, for the most part, freshly felled logs or trees um, that, and you're working with them green. Uh, so yeah, they're you want to keep them either sealed sealed with the the uh, the end grain sealer. Or when you get to this stage, you know, shrink wrap them. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, sure. Good question. Um, Good. And that's it. That's all I had. Yes, questions, please. Uh, bandsaw blades. What do you yes. What do you use when you're cutting rounds out of these blanks? Um, what, I what type of blade? Right. I typically use um, a three TPI hook skip tooth hook blade um like a resaw blade no not a resaw no a three three eighth inch uh it's they're they're pretty three eighth or half inch three tpi uh hook and jen is you raising is jen raising her hand again i see jen nope, no not me Oh, okay. I gotta figure out how to put it down. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fine. No, that's fine. No problem at all. Um, so, does that answer your question, Jim? I can actually, I can send you a link. So, I, I, I find these usually. I find them. Um, um, Highland Wood. I think it's Highland. Highland Woodworking has a really good. Um, they actually uh -huh. market it as a wood turner's bandsaw blade, and it, it is a three eighth inch, uh, three or four TPI blade uh hook they're hook called wood hooker's blades yeah, yeah exactly I just, I just put it in the chat thanks I, thanks scott I, ironically just today i arrived a highlands um resaw blade a half inch one i've been okay. i've been having a lot of trouble with resaw that's a different matter but yeah, they uh, they make a lot of blades but the the wood turners one for wet wood is actually kind of hard to find I've, I've found I've actually found uh, similar ones on Amazon uh, from different vendors on Amazon from time to time. I mean, basically, it's the same. It's the same. This is a three eighth inch, uh, three TPI skip tooth or hook to, hook tooth. Um, hey Joe, yeah. Can you go back to your slide? Um, it's a two or three slides back. It has the half half log on the table. Yeah, uh, one more. There you go on the left there. So, yeah. so yeah. when I do that. And, and I get these corner pieces like that one on the left is gonna be cut out. Um, I found those corner pieces are great if you save them and uh, put them on your bandsaw and cut small blanks out for little birdhouse bases. Oh yeah. Little birdhouse ornaments and I just chuck them in a, chuck them in a uh, you know, plastic container and just let them sit for six months to a year and then they're great to use for next season. Oh yeah, I, I often uh, sell like, just like the piece on either side of the pith. Um, right. I'll salvage as much wood as I can from these from these pieces or from these logs for you know smaller projects. <clears throat> yeah, definitely, good point. I th this is <clears throat> this is Pete Morgenthaler. 
Um, hey, I've Pete. been buying blades from Highland Hardware. Well, they used to be Highland Hardware. Now it's Highland Woodworking. Excuse me, in uh, in Atlanta for uh, a long time. I think their prices are better than uh, uh, Woodcraft. Um, they're uh, they come nice and quick, and they deliver them quickly. And cool. They're, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think I think Scott said he put the link in the chat. I yeah. I asked about this because I made a little jig thing where you put a hole in the middle so you can do a, a slides on a groove so you can do it. Right. Uh, Cir circle. circle jig. Yeah, circle jig. Yep. I found that my I'm using a three inch. I think it's three to me, three teeth branch TPI. But I found that as I got maybe a third of the way or a quarter of the way around, the blade started walking out. And I didn't know if it was the blade fault or if I don't have the pivot in the right relationship to the front cutting edge of the blade or what. But uh, it puzzled me and I thought maybe I'd like to find an answer to it. Yeah, I, I, had, that, I had that walking out with uh, problem two with, it's it's just that and I and it happened on my um, I ha I made a a thing that um, you can turn the blade you can turn the uh, piece of wood on um, you know on a pin and adjust it and uh, I don't know where I got the plan from but uh, it, my problem was I was going too fast so if you just go really slow and let the blade kind of just walk around if you go fast. Man, I'll tell you, it is so, the forces are just unbelievable. And um, that it on it. And then make sure you got your, uh, your guide under the, blade, blade guide under the table uh, tight. Um, well, you know, but yeah, I, I couldn't believe it. I made a perfect spiral one day on that. Uh, <laughs> and I was, I was making small bowls and uh, I'm going, this is really weird. If you go too slow. fast, yeah. you melt your tires. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, one more thing I'd like to point out is um, I go back to my high school days. I had a I had a vocational agriculture teacher who taught us how we had a shop, we had an ag shop. He taught us how to use wood woodworking tools. Uh, and I see a lot of people on YouTube turning a bowl blank, getting their hands between the blade. And the and the left side of the of the, uh, <laughs> of the uh, uh, bandsaw. I think you ought to always work on the right side of the blade, on the outside of it. Keep your hands away from the blade, and keep keep your bow blank on the right side of the blade. Yeah. If, if you get it between the bands, between the blade and and the and the, the left side, you don't know what's going to happen over there. I, th I think you're safe. Nothing you good. You keep the right. bowl on the right side. Thanks, Don. On the right side. And, and you got to remember that the uh, width of your blade has a determination of just how uh, a much of a circle you could make uh, uh, without the, uh, and working in the circle as opposed to uh, having the back cut and then uh, work in. Right. The, the, one, one other thing you need to think about is when you're cutting wet wood, you need to look at the inside of that blade, the, the stuff that builds up on it. That's that I've I've had it, I've had the, the pith build up on the inside of the blade, and you actually gotta stop and take a knife and scrape that stuff off because it makes it when, when you're running a blade with all that crap on the on the on the build up on the blade, when you're running it through wet wood, it's it's a tremendous drag on your saw. Yeah, it, you you need to clean your blades periodically if you're doing a lot of wet wood. I I do that. I I take my I'll just take my blade off and I'll uh, put it in a uh, a soak, you know, of a simple green or some sort of de some sort of degreaser. Let it soak overnight and then get in there with a with a brush and just and it comes off pretty easily. That's what I okay. usually do. Um, can I say just Doug? one thing for for people that haven't done any wet wood that if uh, uh, if if you're using wet wood then the tape, the tops of your uh, bandsaw, the, uh, the 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 blade uh, of your uh, blade, the, uh, are all going to get rusty. So you've got to after oh, you yeah. get done pulling with them, 
you've got to clean them off and oil them up. Otherwise, the equipment's going to just, just get all rusted up on you. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and also, it not only does the junk get in the blade, but it gets on the tires. If you look in the tires, I take a flat edge of my pocket knife and just start scraping that stuff off, and it flakes off. Um, I don't take them off. I just scrape it as the blade goes around and then scrape the rubbers. Well, hey, um, Joe, can I add something? Yeah, this absolutely. Kind of Scott, hi, Scott. How you doing? Good. Hey, so uh, guys, you know, somebody mentioned YouTube and I, I just want to say, especially for the new turners, do not believe the things you're seeing on YouTube are safe. <laughs> Yeah. because you know i can't i can't even make the statement like imagine this in capital letters okay that the people on youtube uh are very often are not using the right tool they're not using the right technique and they're often doing very dangerous things and i find if i write to them they're surprised that i'm willing to tell them but i'm like don't do that you know um <laughs> You, it, what you should do there are there I mean, are a lot of safe. really good videos it's not safe to use a pickup truck as a lay yeah right well maybe if you know what you're doing but there are a lot of uh really good named turners out there on youtube that you can watch but make sure you get a good name of somebody who is an expert and watch them Once you have your blanks prepared, the next step in the process is to create a method to mount or hold your blank on the lathe, and that eventually will allow you to turn the inside and the outside of your bowl. Well, we're going to talk about three different methods that uh, can be used safely to do this, and we're going to talk about them each in some detail. The first one we're going to talk about tonight is the screw chuck. As you can see, uh, I have a couple of chucks here, and with them I have the screw chuck that fits this particular chuck. Um, most chuck sets come with one. Um, they are used to mount your blank um, without needing the tailstock, although uh, your tailstock is recommended. In order to use it, you have to uh, put it inside the jaws of your chuck. Uh, as you can see, uh, there's an edge inside there. And if you look at your screw chuck, what you will see is an edge around it. And what you want to do is clamp the jaws of your chuck inside that edge. Now, in order to make sure that it's mounted in the correct position, you'll also notice that there's some flat spots. Those flat spots are designed to line up with each of the four jaws on your chuck. So you open up your chuck sufficiently to allow the screw to go in between the jaws and then you tighten the jaws down into that space that I pointed out. You tighten it up tight securely so it doesn't move. You make sure that the flat spots are pointed towards your, your uh, jaws. Each jaw should have a flat spot mounted toward it and that'll give you the best orientation so that it won't twist within the chuck. Now the other thing that you need to be concerned about is the size of the hole. Now each, each one of these screws comes, uh, that comes with the sets may be wider or taller depending on the manufacturer. Um, in this case, uh, I have Novachuk here. Um, I know that this particular uh, screw is um, approximately 5 sixteenths. But what you want to make sure of is, is that it is that you make a hole in your blank 
that is the correct size. Now as you can see there are threads all across here. What we were what we are concerned about when we drill the hole is is that it is no larger than the width of the shaft inside the screw. You want the maximum bite into the wood from the threads. So what we need to do is make sure that we have a drill that is the same size or smaller than the center shaft of, of the screw chuck. To do that what I do typically is, is I take the end of it and I match the drill bit to the diameter of that center shaft. So once we have the screw chuck mounted in the chuck and we have it tightened up, you want to make sure that your blank is flat on top. It needs to be flat. The reason is is that the screw itself is not what holds the wood. It is this flat surface uh, on the chuck jaws. The wood is screwed down tight against it. The force is between the screw threads and that flat surface. So the top of your blank needs to be smoothed out, whether you use a chisel or a plane or some process, you need to make sure you have a very flat surface. So the next thing to do is to identify the center of identify the center of your piece. In this particular case, I have a hole that was I used when I used the template. Now the next thing you need to be concerned about is, is that you need to make sure that the height of the, the drill or the depth of the drill is the same as the height of your screw. If you have a chuck that has a long screw then you need to make sure that you've me measured that depth out properly because you want it to seat thoroughly on the surface of the jaws. So to make sure that I have it at the right depth, I'm going to take a piece of tape and I'm going to wrap it around the drill bit at the proper height. Plus a little bit so that I make sure that it's deep enough. The last thing you want is for it to be shallow. All right, so we will put this in the drill. You try to make sure that your drill is uh, in a vertical position. Check around and make sure, and then go ahead and drill down to the tape. Now we have our hole. We can go ahead and mount it on the mount the uh, blank on the on the chuck. So the first thing I'm going to do is put the chuck on the spindle by holding the chuck and turning the hand wheel until we get it to lock up against the spindle. And you always want to make sure that your chuck is bottomed out against the spindle Otherwise, you don't have good solid control of the chuck, and it might, if you have a gap, uh, think about getting one of those nylon washers to fill that gap, or a, a rubber washer to make sure that it's tightly uh, held against the, the spindle and the headstock. So now what we're going to do is we're going to mount this on the screw 
and we're going to drive the screw in by turning the hand wheel and holding on to the blank and keep winding it in until it makes firm contact with with the top of the chuck jaws. Now several people will have demonstrated who uh, basically turn the lathe on and, and drive it on and let go, but I don't recommend you do that because um, it, it can lead to some problems. Um, and you need to be an experienced turner to do that kind of thing. So now we have it pretty well mounted. I'm going to tighten it down to make sure there's good solid contact between the top of the chuck jaws and the blank. And now we have a, a good, good solid piece of uh, wood mounted on the, on the jaws and that will allow us to turn a tenon or a recess. Okay, so for the second option on mounting your blank on the lathe, I've laid out a series of uh, face plates. And what you'll notice is, is that the face plates are different thicknesses. They have different hole patterns on them. Um, this, this one happens to have four holes. It's pretty thick. This one has uh, got eight holes and it's also a pretty thick piece of metal. Um, this particular one is thinner. Uh, it has a thicker rim but it's thinner in the center. It also has a slightly different hole pattern. Um, the main point of these is, is that you need to decide which size you need. Face plates come in a range of sizes and uh, the prices vary accordingly and it's always good to have several on hand. Uh, but if you have a big blank or a, a very wet blank that could be out of balance or uh, whatnot, a good solid substantial uh, face plate several inches in diameter uh, is probably the way to go. If you have a smaller piece that um, is uh, not out of balance, uh, you know, a smaller face plate may be sufficient. The main thing is that um, when you mount a face plate on a piece of wood, be sure to put a screw in all the holes. Make sure that you lock down every part of that face plate on the wood, particularly if it's green wood. Now what we don't recommend is, is we don't recommend that you use uh, sheetrock or drywall screws uh, simply because they're too brittle. Um, they tend to, uh, to break easily and so uh, if, you, if you see a screw that looks like this, I'll try to zoom in a little bit for you. Um, don't, don't use it to mount, to mount a, uh, a bowl blank. It just, it's not safe. So what we do recommend is, is that you use a good solid stainless steel wood screw uh, you can either use Phillips head or square drive. I prefer square drive, but these happen to be uh, Phillips head. Um, or you can use a good heavy uh, pen head sheet metal screw. Uh, the main thing here is you have a, a good heavy thread. Uh, these do come in both square drive and Phillips. The other thing that you need to be concerned about is, is that when you put a screw in 
to the face plate, you want to make sure that it extends far enough out that you have at least seven threads in the wood. In this case, there would be more than enough. Um, but if you have a thicker face plate, um, you might have to have a longer screw in order to, to get a good seven thread bite out of each screw. The one thing you don't want to do is, is you do not want to use short screws. They, they won't hold if you have a particularly wet piece of wood or a piece of wood that's unbalanced. You want all the holding power you can get. So make sure that the screws extend at least seven threads off the bottom of the, of the face plate. Um, Longer is always safer, but it's not necessary to go too deep. Wood, wood screws or good solid 8 or 12, uh, number 10 or number 12 pan head sheet metal screws are a good choice. Okay, so I have a, a, about a, a 10 inch blank here. Um, I've already marked out the centers, but it's always good to find as close to the center as you can. Um, there are uh, commercial choices out there, but the, uh, you can make your own if you choose. But if you have a uh, put a pinhole down here, there are jigs that can go down and find that pinhole and hold your faceplate in the exact center of the wood. But in this case, I'm just going to sight down over the center until I find the center of it. Now, this particular faceplate has a uh, recess or, or a uh, um, dovetail inside the screw to match the screw head. So in this case, I'm using a wood screw and not a pan head screw. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one screw in and I'm going to drive it about halfway down because if I drive it all the way down it might torque and you don't want that to happen. So now I'll go to the opposite side And I'll drive that one all the way down. Okay, so we have four screws in here, which is what this particular um, faceplate takes. I've used good solid wood screws in. They're well over seven threads deep into the wood. And now I'm going to mount it in on the, on the lathe. Now, to mount it, you hold it up to the, the spindle and you set the face plate on the spindle. Let me give you a better look at this. So in order to mount this face plate on the spindle, it's best to push it up to the spindle and use the hand wheel to turn it. Uh, this will prevent you from cross threading the face plate on the spindle and you keep doing that until you get it all the way up. Now I've got it well on there. I'm holding the hand wheel and I'm turning the wood just to nudge it up. Now one thing you want to make sure of is, is that if you have it you lock your spindle 
and you give it a good twist in order to make sure that it's well mounted. And you see here that I have it well up against the, um, the spindle so that there's a good, good point of contact right here. It won't come loose. You don't want it to. Now, the thing is with the screw chuck and the face plate is you don't necessarily have to have the tailstock up against the blank, although for safety purposes it's always a good habit to get into uh, as you're starting your initial shaping to bring the tailstock up and put it into the blank just, just to hold everything secure. When, when you finish shaping and turning and you want to clear the last of it out, you pull the tailstock away and you'll be ready to go to finish off your tenon or your recess or whatever. So um, that's how you put a faceplate together. The final method that I want to talk about is using a uh, four-prong drive center uh, similar to this. A lot of the lathes that you buy come with one, but you can buy them fairly cheaply. Um, they also come in uh, another form. This one happens to have a number two Morris taper on it, which will fit inside the spindle. But there are also uh, drive, drive centers, spurred drive centers, that literally uh, screw on to the spindle uh, on your, uh, on your uh, one and a quarter, one by eight uh, spindle threads. So you can use either one of them. Uh, but the main thing is, is that you want to have pretty sharp spurs, pretty pronounced spurs. If these get dull or, uh, or chipped off, uh, you can try to file them to get the uh, sharpness back on them or uh, just go ahead and buy another one because uh, you need to have a good bite in the wood in order to uh, hold on to it and to turn it. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to kind of get an idea where my center of my bowl is and I'm using a center finder. It's not going to be exactly accurate but it's it's close enough for what I'm going to do tonight. I'm just going to take some readings here in different directions. So center is somewhere right around in there. Now this particular piece uh, has its bark on it, so if you're going to do a natural edge bowl and you're using a, a green piece of wood, um, remember that underneath the bark is the cambium layer, and the cambium layer can be very soft in a piece of green wood. So you, you want to make sure that uh, when you put your drive spur in that it's, it's solidly in the wood. Um, if you try to do it uh, just on the bark uh, and drive it down on the, on the wood right here in the bark, um, there's a good chance that it'll spin out or um, it'll come loose and wobble. Uh, there's just all kinds of bad things that can happen. So uh, what you need to do is to either take a chisel and, and clear off a piece of the bark or uh, in this case what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually use a drill and I'm going to drill down into the, to the wood at least the thickness of the top of this drive. Um, that actually gives you um, a chance to get well into the wood before, uh, before the uh, drive spurs start to engage. So the first thing I want to do is get an idea of how what the diameter of my drive is and it looks like it's about an inch. So I will get out a one inch Forstner bit uh, 
Uh, I don't know that it has to be exactly the same size, but uh, as long as it has enough space, that should do it. I could probably use a 1 and a 16th, and that would work just as well. So I'm going to approximate the center on this side. And as you notice, I'm drilling into the wood pretty well here. I want to get in there so that I'm into that cambium layer and maybe through it. That looks pretty good. So now what you could do at this point is put it in there and give it a few whacks. But if you do, don't use a hammer because a metal hammer will mushroom out the end of this Morris taper and you don't want that to happen. So either use a wooden mallet or a rubber mallet and you can give it a couple of good sharp wax and get it, get it seated well and that's not going anywhere. So now what you can do is bring up your tailstock and uh, get, get rid of a few things here. And you can lock it in. And one thing you want to make sure of is that you don't have creep in your tailstock. So make sure whether you're going up or down that you lock it down pretty good. Now, what I have done in the past is take my wooden mallet and give it a good couple of whacks just to make sure it's well seated. If your particular tailstock goes down, you can take the butt of a tool or you can take your wooden mallet and give it a couple of good wraps. And make sure it's locked in tight. And then go ahead and squeeze it up. Make sure you have a good solid connection between the, the live center and the wood. And of course you have a good connection with your uh, drive, your four, four prong drive. Now as you notice in my particular case with this lathe, um, I have to be uh, concerned because the motor is on on the inside so if I try to do this particular kind of mount I'm not going to be successful. Uh, it's just simply a design problem that came with my lathe but on a uh, Powermatic or a one-way lathe um, or any of the lathes that don't uh, have their motor mounted up on top like this one uh, this would work fine. Um, as it is, I, I'm well secured in there. The wood's not going anywhere. Uh, and I can go ahead and start to shape the bottom. Now one of the things that I will point out that is an advantage to doing this is it's cheap. You don't have to buy anything extra. Um, it's fast um, and it, it gives you uh, pretty good control over what you're doing. The other thing is, is if you have a piece of wet wood, um, as you notice, this is pretty thick here. If that happens to be full of water uh, or whatever, it may be very unbalanced. So in order to remedy that, you can take, take this and move the wood around. You can tilt it and change the angle that it's in that it's mounted on the wood so you can rebalance it now if you notice I did manage to free up one side to spin all the way around uh, so 
Um, if you're in some sort of production situation and you don't want to spend a lot of time mounting uh, plates or, you know, drilling holes for screw chucks and that kind of thing, this is, this is perfectly uh, acceptable. Uh, if you watch some of uh, Stuart Batty's uh, demonstrations, he very often uh, puts a blank in exactly this way. He goes in, he turns a tenon on the uh, back side of it, he turns it around, and then he turns another tenon on the other side. So he can mount it, shape it, and then turn it around, mount it, and hollow it out. So that's the three principal methods that we recommend for mounting your bowl blanks so that you can turn a tenon or a recess uh, for, uh, to mount it on the lathe. Um, each one of them uh, is secure, um, especially if you, in the case of the face plate or the screw chuck, you bring the tailstock up to, to secure it until you're ready to turn the center of it. Uh, however, you can turn the entire bottom without that, but it's recommended just for security. Um, the problem with the screw chuck and the face plate is that you need a little extra equipment. It takes a little extra time. Sometimes you have to drill pilot holes uh, in the wood for each of the screws on a face plate. Um, you uh, definitely need to make sure you have the right kind of screws. Uh, and so uh, it could be problematic, um, but uh, from a positive standpoint, it's, it's a very secure way to mount your wood. With the drive center and the live center configuration, uh, you can get a very secure uh, mount. Uh, again, you have to be sure that with green wood that you, uh, and if you're going through the bark, that you uh, make, make a place in the wood for the drive center to uh, mount. Otherwise, um, it can spin loose and go flying off the lathe. And uh, so, um, I, I highly recommend that if you're going to do it that way that you practice a few times with some wet wood to make sure you understand what you're doing and when you turn the lathe on be sure to stay out of the way. Now unfortunately uh, again with my particular lathe I don't use this because of the motor mount but also uh, you have to be aware that when you mount wood in uh, this fashion with the drive center and the live center, um, speed is an absolute mandatory consideration. Um, my particular lathe, uh, the lowest speed it starts at is 450 uh, RPMs. Now that doesn't sound like much, but when you have an unbalanced piece of wet wood on there, 450 RPMs is a, is a very, very uh, daunting speed. It, it'll shake and rattle and roll um, a lot. So uh, if you have a bigger lathe and you have speed control, you don't have those concerns. But if you have a mini lathe or a mini lathe um, that's belt driven, you only have certain speed ranges that you can work from. So. Uh, if you're going to use this particular method, be sure you take that into consideration. Um, I hope that gives you a lot of information about how to uh, mount your bowl blank prior to turning your bowl. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, let, it, let me know.